I'm going to summarize all of Romans for your future study. And so having this, even just this one section in the future, I'm going to summarize Romans chapters 1 through 8. I'm grateful to Derek Prince. I am acknowledging that I stole this 100% from him. I just turned his notes into my summary. I'm giving you Derek Prince right now. Thank you, Derek Prince in the cloud of witnesses. This is an analysis of Romans chapters 1 through 8. Romans is the book of the theology of grace that set us into the Protestant Reformation. We're here because Luther read Paul out of Romans. And Romans used to be studied in secular law schools. At least in America, the arguments Paul makes are so legally brilliant, so line upon line, precept upon precept, given the case he's trying to make, he makes it so flawlessly that law schools used to make their students study Paul. You can't get better than Romans for understanding the new life and the power of grace to uh, 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 inaugurate, initiate the new creation out of the new covenant. And we know Romans 8 is kind of the pinnacle of that. That's where we get to all of the resurrection promises and there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the problem is you can't get to the 8th chapter without going through the first 7. You can't just start in Romans 8 and be it and live it and feel it and experience it. You have to fully understand and comprehend the case Paul makes so that you're, you have tools for your, old man, for, your, for your new man to comprehend and, uh, and apply truth to your life. There's no such thing as instant Romans 8. It's like a coffee percolator. You have to just keep marinating in it and, and brewing in it. And the moment you've left confidence and entered com, uh, condemnation, you're out of Romans 8. So you got to kind of work back through and percolate some more and understand the progression of the first seven chapters. So here's the progression of logic. And a lot of this I've already talked about here and there, but I'm doing this now because this becomes kind of a summary of all that's come before encapsulated in Romans 1 to 8. And I would encourage you, take this and in the future, read through Romans with each one of these in mind. Chapter 1, Paul is dealing with the sinfulness of the whole human race. That's chapter 1 of Romans. Paul is doing an overview of the sinfulness of the human race and, and the, uh, the unavoidable and total nature of that sinfulness. In chapter 2, he deals with the sinfulness of religious people. So it's not just the human race in general, it's that even religious people, particularly the Jews, in this case for Paul, I'm not singling them out, but for Paul that was how he drove the point home, it's that it's not just humans in general, but even religious people, even the Jewish people, who were given the law that provided the path to righteousness, the law was insufficient to actually help them achieve that righteousness. So the sinfulness of religious people who think they're right because they know what is right. He deals with that issue. What you know isn't what makes you righteous. What you know isn't what makes you holy in terms of facts and the knowledge of good and evil. Now, knowing is a different kind of equation Later on in Paul, when he says, you need to know that your old man was crucified. That's a different kind of knowing. It's not knowing the knowing of the knowledge of good and evil and the facts and commandments of the law as if the knowing equaled holiness. You, you understand the difference? Chapter 3 squelches the claim of right knowledge once and for all, right at the beginning, so that by the end... We're offered God's solution, which is the propitiation and redemption through the shed blood of Christ that yields forgiveness. Humanity in general, religious people in particular, there are all kinds of systems that teach you, if you know this and if you do this, you can be good enough. All over the world, all kinds of systems, unfortunately, including Christianity, if you know this, and if you do this, you can be right with God. 
Chapter 4. Paul chooses two of the great ancestors of Israel, Abraham and David, to prove by their own testimony that even under the old covenant, no one was ever justified by works. Romans chapter 5. I looked at this in detail. It's the elaborate contrast between the first Adam and the last Adam, Christ, with the two producing dramatically opposite results in their lineage. We have the two family trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. You have Moses representing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Christ is the tree of life. Two family trees, the covenant of performance and the covenant of grace. The, the, the binary nature, the, the double-mindedness of man is meant to be brought to death so that we can be raised in singleness of fellowship and pursuit. Singleness of life with Him. Chapter 6. Chapter 6 deals decisively with the old man. I looked at that just a few sections ago. Uh, uh, that we have to know that our old self was, our old man was crucified with Christ. Paul, Galatians 2.20, I was crucified with Christ. Romans 6 is the premier chapter that deals decisively with the old man. And until you know that the old rebel inside you was put to death, you will never get free from the power of sin. Until you know that the old rebel was put to death, you can't get free from that. You can be repeatedly forgiven, but the old rebel will always reassert himself because forgiveness is just the replacement of the murderer. And the murderer still goes free. God's remedy for the rebel is execution. And God's good news is that the execution took place when Jesus died on the cross. This is the progression of Romans. Now right there you would think that we're finally ready for Romans chapter 8. This is where we jump to, you aren't condemned anymore. Your old man died. Derek Prince used to talk about how he thought it was a mistake that we went from Romans 6 to Romans 7. Why back to that, that wrestling with the law where Paul talks about, you know, the law stirs coveting. I didn't covet until the law told me not to covet and then I coveted like crazy. Why are we back to talking about the law? We've already dealt with the old man. Well, I can tell you, experience and observation demonstrate that the last and final obstacle is freedom from the law. You can actually lay hold of the principle of the death of the old man. You can lay hold of that but in your practice still struggle with law thinking. You can lay hold of the fact and even begin to confess, my old man was crucified with Christ, but until your mind is renewed to what comes up out of the grave and the newness of life and the superiority of the new covenant to the old covenant, there's so much teaching in the church and there's so much life experience that is constantly reinforcing law. You get what you deserve. You work hard. You get promoted. There are no free lunches. What goes around comes around. You got to, you know, take care of business. And that's how the world works. And actually, it is... It's easier discipleship. If I just tell you what you're supposed to do and then get on to you when you don't do it. You actually get better short-term results. And this world is so busy and so rushed, and everyone is living out of a performance mindset, including our overworked pastors, <laughs> who are feeling judged for whether or not their people feel successful and victorious in life. And there's all kind of short circuits that the law provides because it's so clear. Just do this. Just don't do that. Okay, we checked that one off the list. Let's move on to the other. We're going to stack up a bunch of these and we're going to call that a victorious life. There's shortcuts that the law provides because... It's, it's clear dots on the page and you can connect the dots. It does all the stuff that the knowledge of good and evil does. 
You don't just die to the old man. You have to go through Romans 7 and understand, O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And all of that conversation is about the conflict that we have and the turmoil that is produced by a life lived under the law. That is the final nail in the coffin by which Romans 8.1 becomes a living reality. There is therefore now no condemnation. Because it is the law that condemns the old man. So if the old man is dead, but the law is still alive, you're still living in half of the equation. You have to realize that God... In Hebrews, we looked at it. I'm going to look at it again before we're done this afternoon. He says the law is obsolete. And we're going to look at a passage where he says he finds fault with it. He found fault with the law for a very clear reason. 